Good morning, my dear students. Today we are going to talk about two very important aspects about the plants. One is the transport in plants, and another one is the translocation of water in plants. <coughs> okay. Right. What is a transport in plants? And what is the translocation? In my first class, when I was uh, talking about the osmosis, I was uh, telling you that the root hairs are responsible for the absorption of water from the soil. <coughs> Once the water is absorbed by the root hairs, they cannot keep it forever. It has to be translocated, it has to be transported, it has to be transported to the different parts of the plant. It is only for that purpose water is absorbed from the soil. The stem, root, leaves, flower, fruit, seeds, all the organs in the plants, they should get sufficient water. But remember, these organs cannot absorb the water. So, the absorbing organ is different and the beneficiary is different. Okay? So, other organs are the beneficiary organs. <coughs> they are getting the water which was absorbed by the root system. How this transportation, how this uh, translocation is a taking place in the plants. That's what we are going to learn in this one hour. <clears throat> what are the different principles involved in this? We are going to see now. See, <clears throat> in flowering plants, substances to be transported are water, mineral nutrients, organic nutrients and plant growth regulators. So, four substances are to be transported from the root to the different parts of the plants. Water, mineral nutrients. See, mineral nutrients are different from the water. Water, when we refer to water in biology, it refers to the pure water. Mineral nutrients means yeah, the water along with the different nutrients that we are adding to the plants for the better growth. Then the organic nutrients and finally the plant growth regulators. Plant growth hormones are secreted by the plant just like the hormones are secreted in the human body. Growth regulators when we are going to the topic on regulators, we will study it a very detailed way. There are growth promoters, there are growth retarders, growth regulators. And these are all controlling the different life activities of the plant. And these growth regulators are secreted in one part and then they have to be transported to the different parts of the plant. So, <coughs> water has to be transported. Mineral nutrients have to be transported, organic nutrients have to be transported and plant growth regulators have to be transported. Have you taken down? So, these are the four materials which are to be transported from the root to the different parts of the plant. Fine. Now, how many types of movements are there in the plants? Two types of movements are there. Two types of movement. What are they? <coughs> movement over the short distance and movement over the larger distance. So, these are the two types of movements. <coughs> See, in our life also, it, it all depends upon the vehicle that we are using for movement is mainly depending on the distance we have to travel. <coughs> Let's imagine, you want to go to a restroom within your house, you can't use a bicycle. Will you be able to use a bicycle to go to the restroom? If you want to go to the kitchen? So, that you make by, by a particular movement, you walk and then reach that place. 
But at the same time, you want to go from Pondicherry to Chennai, you want to go. That distance you can never walk. You can't go even in a cycle. <coughs> then for that you have to choose a different mode. Okay. So, what type of organs are involved in the movement is depending on the distance that the nutrients have to travel. So, for the short distances, two <coughs> materials are one. one is by diffusion and by the cytoplasmic streaming by two methods. So, by diffusion and by cytoplasmic streaming. These two are sufficient for traveling a short distance. But if it has to travel for a longer distance, then the vascular system, which is in the form of a xylem and a phloem, are essential. <coughs> now, going back, you must uh, be knowing by now very clearly what the diffusion is. What's a diffusion? Very often, when, uh, when, when we are talking about uh, diffusion, we take a very, very common example that everybody can understand. You just take, a, take water in a beaker. Okay? You take water in a beaker. And then just put one drop of red ink or blue ink, whatever it is in that. Just you put a drop of ink in that. What will happen? Till the whole water is completely becoming blue or red, this drop of ink that you are putting will be slowly, slowly, slowly diffusing. This is one liquid diffusing in another liquid. Another best example is, if you just open a scent bottle in one corner of your room, it will, you will be able to, all the people, all the other people in the room, they will be able to feel the smell. How? It is because of the scent molecules diffusing in the air molecules which is present in the room. So, here, here the one vapor molecule is moving towards another structure, another air. So, here it is uh, the movement of movement from a uh, higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. Here also it is uh, from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. That is the diffusion. Cytoplasmic streaming within a cell you are able to see the cytoplasm and uh, please uh, don't be under the impression that uh, this uh, cytoplasm will be always uh, stationary. It's not at all like that. It is always in a uh, streaming motion. The cytoplasm will be in a streaming motion. So, some of the minerals which are present here, when the cytoplasm is uh, moving, it will be moving along with the cytoplasm. So, movement of molecules is uh, taking place by diffusion as well as by cytoplasmic streaming. But when it has to travel a long distance, then of course, the xylem and the phloem, you know, xylem and the phloem, they go by a common terminology called tracheary element. It comes from the word trachea. <coughs> See, you, you must uh, hear this word in zoology also. This is the Tracheary portion, tracheary. Okay. So, tracheary means uh, it is a tube, a strengthened tube. That is the meaning of that word. So, xylem is a water conducting element and phloem is a food conducting element. These are two elements are involved in the translocation. Now, coming to the third aspect, namely direction of a transport. Now, there are two types of uh, uh, transport is there. One is unidirectional, another one is multidirectional. <coughs> what is an unidirectional transport? Must be a very easy thing. Uni means one, multi means many. So, when the movement is uh, taking, uh, moving in only one direction, it is uh, called unidirectional. Then it takes place with the help of asylum. <coughs> so, when 
this is the plant, a tree, a big tree is there. And uh, when it is absorbing the water <coughs> through the root system, the water is uh, going into the different parts of the plant with the help of it's a unidirectional flow. So there it's flowing in one direction. <coughs> then multidirectional transport is by means of a phloem. It is another uh, translocating element. See, phloem. This is the shoot system. The leaves are there, and uh, you know the leaves are responsible for the photosynthetic activity. Starch is uh, prepared, converted into sugar. And then the plant is preparing a lot of food materials. These food materials have to be transported to the different parts of the plant. You may be asking why it is a multidirectional cell. See, the food that is prepared in the, by the leaves, they have to move. Sometimes uh, they have to be stored in the stem itself. Do you know any plant where the food is stored in the stem? Very easy. Very, very easy. See, in sugar cane, the food is stored, the sugar is stored only in the stem. But in certain plants, which you may not be knowing, the food is stored in the stem only, but it is in the underground. Underground stem modification is a very big topic in botany. You must have studied. See, potato is only a stem modification. Onion, it is another stem modification. Garlic, the third stem modification. So, in all these cases, the food is stored only in a stem. There are 101 plants where the food is stored in the leaf itself that we are taking or consuming in the form of leafy vegetables every morning. Food is stored in the fruit, food is stored in the seeds. And food is stored in different parts of the plant. So, the food that is prepared by a plant has to move to the different parts in different directions. And so, the movement of food in the phloem becomes multidirectional. Whereas, the movement of water from the root to the different parts of the plant, it becomes mostly unidirectional. Now, what are the materials to be transported? We have come to the third aspect. <coughs> what are the materials to be transported? First one is photosynthetase. What are photosynthetase? That which are prepared with the help of the photosynthesis is called as a photosynthetase. Mostly it is a starch and sugar. <coughs> Mostly it is a starch. Okay. So, the, the product which is formed as a result of the photosynthesis, it, is, it has to be exported from the leaves to the other parts of the plants including the storage organ. That is what I was explaining to you with the help of the last slide. Storage organ means your stem could be a storage organ, your leaf could be a storage organ, a flower fruit, seeds, anything could be a storage organ depending upon the plant. So, from the leaves, they have to be transported to the storage organ. So, photosynthetates are the main materials to be transported. Then, the next one is uh, mineral nutrients. They have to be transported from the root to the different parts, namely stem, leaves and growing organ. So, photosynthetase is from the leaves to the storage organ and the mineral nutrients from the root to the growing organs. So, these are the two nutrients or the two materials to be transported in a plant. Now, <coughs> Just like you have got a traffic on your very busy road, you have got a traffic of the compounds also. <coughs> See, when the movement is uh, taking place, I told you it is a unidirectional movement, multidirectional movement, 
the water has to flow from the uh, xylem to the different parts of the plants and the photosynthesis have to be transferred and transported to the different parts of the plant like that when so much of a movement is there then there takes place a traffic <coughs> so the traffic of compounds is a complex so you don't get a traffic in the highways alone you get a traffic in the plant also so you get uh, the, this uh, traffic is a uh, more complex than the traffic that you are getting in the uh, normal road and highways this uh, traffic of a uh, compound is a uh, complex moving in different directions each organ receiving some and giving out some other substances <coughs> see we have got a very clear uh, rules in a traffic system whenever you are going you have to go keep left they say and then when you are coming you have to come in the right direction even when there are rules sometimes you end in complexity but when the plant is involved in a lot of traffic it results in a very complex type of movement the tra traffic of a compound is a complex moving in different directions each organ receiving some and giving out some other substances Okay, fine. <clears throat> now, the next one is uh, means of uh, transport. What's the means of uh, transport? Once again, there are uh, two types of uh, means of uh, transport. One is yeah, passive transport and other one is active. Whenever you are getting a term in biology called a passive, you can expect another term active also. These are two more opposite to working principles. Passive means a very quiet, calm without involving any energy releasing processes so no energy is involved here whereas in active transport energy is involved in the form of atp molecules okay no passive transport is a taking place through the diffusion and a modified type of a diffusion this is a normal diffusion facilitated diffusion so two types of diffusions are involved in the passive transport just now I was just telling you what's the diffusion very clearly you just take a beaker <coughs> a beaker filled with water put a drop of red ink in that does it involve any active transport if you just drop put a drop of water it will get automatically diffused no active transport is there it's a passive activity as I was just now telling you just when you open a center bottle in one corner of the room it is a passive transport it doesn't involve the spending of any energy so diffusion is always a passive activity whereas when active transport is an energy spending activity now a modified version of a diffusion is a facilitated diffusion we will study this and then we will go to the active <coughs> transport also now this will be able to explain to you very clearly about the diffusion and the facilitated diffusion. See, this what is the difference between the normal diffusion and the facilitated diffusion? Facilitated diffusion is uh, taking place with the help of a protein. <coughs> you need a protein molecule for this type of a diffusion. It cannot uh, take place in a normal way. So, with the help of a protein molecule, the protein is uh, carrying the material to be transported from one place to the another place. So, it is uh, called as a facilitated diffusion. <coughs> now, this is uh, the outer region of the cell, this is a cell membrane, this is the inner portion. From here to here, it is uh, passing through a <coughs> protein molecule. So, both are passive transport uh, system. One is a simple diffusion another one is a yeah, facilitated diffusion S simple diffusion takes place uh, just like that it just by through the membrane just through the membrane it gets uh, diffused uh, as uh, uh, the red ink drop is uh, getting diffused into the water whereas here a uh, carrier is essential a uh, carrier molecule becomes essential what is this uh, carrier molecule it is a protein molecule the protein molecule is a carrying a substance 
through the protein to the inner area of the cytoplasm. So, this is a simple diffusion, this is a facilitated diffusion. But remember, both the diffusions are of the passive type. Now, now this diagram shows a uh, um, little more detailed way about the facilitated diffusion. See how it is uh, taking place. It is uh, from a region of higher concentration. More molecules are there on the outer surface. This is inside the cell. And here it is uh, just uh, pausing through the protein molecules. See how it is uh, moving. It is uh, getting attached here. It is uh, moving. And then finally it is uh, uh, reaching the inner side of the cell. So, the facilitated diffusion is uh, taking place with the help of the protein molecules. And this uh, slide beautifully shows uh, how the facilitated diffusion is uh, taking place from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. <coughs> Good. Now, this is a very beautiful slide to give you a comparison about the Passive transport and then the active transport. I divided the transport into, you remember? You remember? Come on, tell me. See, it, divide, it is divided into two types, namely the diffusion and then the active transport. Diffusion, I divided into two, namely the normal diffusion and then the facilitated diffusion. Then active transport, I put as a third category. Now, this uh, passive diffusion, <coughs> is uh, this type and this is active transport here you see now first thing is in the passive transport a concentrated uh, material is there and it is uh, moving through a cell membrane from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration is the principle of diffusion principle of diffusion is, itself is always like that and it is a passive movement no energy is involved Whereas here you see the region of a low concentration, very few molecules are there, but still it, the, these molecules are getting accumulated and it is uh, taking place uh, through the proteins. Okay, now this uh, facilitated diffusion and active transport both are involving the protein molecules, and in addition to this, ATP energy spending is also involved in this. Okay, fine. So, this shows uh, very clearly the difference between the normal diffusion and the active transport. Now, it is a passive movement from one part of the cell to the other part or over short distances, <coughs> that is uh, from the intercellular spaces of the leaf to the outside. Now, no energy expenditure is there. This is what I have been telling you very clearly. Many times I have told you. There is no expenditure. There is no spending of energy for this. Then, movement is in a random fashion. That is very important. For a diffusion, the movement is in a random fashion. <coughs> Fourth very important point is, it is from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration just like osmosis just like osmosis diffusion is also taking place from a higher region to a lower region now you may be asking a doubt sir in both the cases you say it is from a higher region to a lower region osmosis and diffusion. then what's the difference between the diffusion and osmosis you must be remembering very well on the first day i was telling you very clearly the movement of uh, water molecules come up with a higher potential to a region of a lower potential when they are separated by a semi permeable membrane. You remember that word? Semi permeable membrane. So, a membrane is there in osmosis, whereas no membrane is there in a diffusion. See, when you are putting a drop of ink in a water, do you put a membrane there? No. So, no membrane is involved here, whereas a membrane is there in the osmosis, okay. Now, that makes the difference between the osmosis and diffusion, okay. But here also, it is a primary region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. Then, 
Diffusion is a slow process and it is independent of a living system. This is not a living system. When you put a drop of water, when you put a drop of ink in a bottle of water, it is not a living system. So, it is independent of a living system. It can take place in a non-living system also and it can take place in a living system also, of course, at the same time. It is also affected by <coughs> permeability of membrane. This is very important. Permeability, separating them. And then what are all the other affecting factors? It is affected by the permeability, first point. Then temperature, <coughs> second point. Pressure, third point. So these are the three factors affecting the diffusion. So what are the three factors affecting the diffusion? Permeability of the membrane, temperature and then the pressure. These three things are affecting the rate of diffusion. See? Then now we have come to the facilitator diffusion. <coughs> Here concentration gradient must already be the present for molecules to diffuse even if facilitated by proteins. You see, even if it is facilitated by a protein, <coughs> a concentration gradient is very, very essential. From a region of higher concentration only to a region of lower concentration, it can flow. So, there should be a difference of a concentration. This is a very important for a yeah, facilitated diffusion. In this type, special proteins help move substances across the membrane, but without ATP. Now, this makes the difference between the active transport and the facilitated diffusion. See, facilitated diffusion and active transport. Both of them are involving the proteins. You see, you have to understand this point very clearly. Please don't get confused. See, here also proteins is involved. There also protein is involved. In active transport also proteins are involved. But here in facilitated diffusion, no ATP, no energy is involved. But there energy is involved because there it is a taking place from a region of a lower concentration to a higher concentration. Okay. <clears throat> so, in this type a special proteins help move substances across the membranes without energy. Transport rate reaches a maximum when all the protein transporters are being used. There is a point called saturation point here. <clears throat> then, Facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is a specific allowing cell to select substances for uptake. It is uh, sensitive to inhibitors which react with the proteins chain, side chains. So, these are the other two factors involved in the rate of diff facilitated diffusion. Now, Proteins form channels in membrane for molecules to pass through. Some channels are always open. <coughs> some channels are always open while some can be controlled. Some are large allowing variety of molecules to cross. So, proteins are very, that's the key word in this slide. Proteins are the important thing. Only they form the channels. Only with the help of the proteins, then transport is possible. So, proteins form the channels in the membrane for the passing through. Now, certain pores are present on the surface of the membranes. Certain pores are there. What are these pores? These pores are called as porins. So, porins are proteins forming huge pores in the outer membranes of plastids, mitochondria and some bacteria also allowing small protein molecules to pass through. These pores are called as 
porins understand that very clearly please make a note <coughs> what is a porin sometimes they may be asking in uh, one word answer what's a porin so porin is nothing but a pore you can remember this word very easily so porin pore so it is a pore that is a form of the protein so porin porins are proteins forming huge pores in outer membrane of the plastids mitochondria and some bacteria allowing small protein molecules to pass through <coughs> extracellular molecule bound to transport a protein passes through membrane and transport protein releases it inside the cell how it is transported is being explained by this point so the proteins are able to carry the materials which are to be transported they take it from outside the cell and then it is released inside the cell okay water channels made up of eight different type of aquaporins are there it's an additional information for you so porins are of a different type aquaporin is only one type there <coughs> now passive uniport symport and antiports so this is a very important point sometimes they may be asking each one of this in now very short answer so you must be able to understand what is an uniport what's a symport what is an antiport now <coughs> you will be able to understand this very clearly with the help of the slide that i am going to show in the next one when a molecule moves across a membrane independent of other molecule it is a uniport both molecules cross the membrane in the same direction then it is called a symport when one is moving in one direction another is moving in another direction it is called a antiport now this uh, slide will be able to show you very clearly what different systems of a port is see uniport only one is moving through with the help of the protein to the other surface here two are involved two types of materials are transported from the inner region to the or from the outer region to the inner region so sim sim means you know it's a combination so two are transported now we see in antiport two are transported or many are transported but they are transported in different directions when one is moving in this direction another is moving in another direction so something is moving from outside cell to the inside cell something is moving from outside cell to the inside both are taking place simultaneously here that type of a transport is called as an antiport many types of molecules are moving in the same direction symport only one moving in one direction it is uniport i think now i have made this very clearly okay <coughs> active transport is the pumping of molecules against concentration gradient by using energy atp is a uphill transport the active transport is also called as uphill transport please note down this point it is carried out by membrane proteins which transport substances from low concentration to high concentration this point i have been telling you from the very beginning active transport means from low concentration to high concentration it will involve the spending of atp energy molecules like enzymes carrier proteins is very specific in carrying a specific molecule across the membrane they are sensitive to inhibitors that react with the protein side chains transport rate is a maximum when all protein transporters are used or when they are saturated <coughs> protein is needed for facilitated diffusion and for active transport i i i, may, I stressed this point very clearly protein is the common substance both for facilitated diffusion and for active transport remember facilitated diffusion is coming under the passive transport okay in passive transport i divide into two one is a normal diffusion facilitated diffusion here this is active transport for 
active transport as well as for the facilitated diffusion you need protein hence so they show common characters so highly selective so liable for the saturation and then it is responding to the inhibitors under the hormonal regulation diffusion both facilitated or simple only along the concentration gradient without the use of energy so normal diffusion or facilitated diffusion whatever it is it is a taking place only from a region of higher concentration to a lower concentration that is it is a following the concentration rule concentration gradient rule what is a concentration gradient rule when the movement is a taking place from a higher region to a lower region it is a concentration gradient rule and in active transport it will be from a lower region to a higher region by spending energy perhaps i think this is the last slide for the transport system it shows very clearly between the difference between the passive transport and the active transport <coughs> see number 1 no energy is needed no atp is involved here it requires the use of energy from the atp molecules <coughs> now passive transport down a grade a concentration gradient from uh, from a high to low here it will be from low to high okay <coughs> facilitated diffusion requires the use of a protein some types require the use of a protein carrier only some types not all includes osmosis and a simple diffusion which do not require special protein there are protein carriers here includes endocytosis and it's a, it is a, the movement of larger molecules into a cell when more bigger molecules are involved normally it is a taking place by the active transport system next one we are going to another very important aspect in the water movement it is what is called as a translocation of solutes now in higher plants food is synthesized only in the green leaves which are the site of the photosynthesis it's called photosynthesis another term is being used for this from here the food is uh, translocated to the different parts of the plant in the soluble form the process by which the synthesized food from the leaves is uh, translocated to the different parts of the plant depending on their requirement is uh, called translocation so what, this is what is uh, called as a translocation <laughs> translocation is of two types translocation of water and a translocation of food translocation of water is from the stem to the different parts of the plant translocation of the food is from the leaves to the different parts of the plants depending on the area where the food has to be stored now direction of a translocation translocation of a food occurs in the downward <coughs> down, upward and the lateral uh, directions you see see from the upper part upper part of the plant this is where the photosynthesizers are manufactured they have to come to the root sometimes food is stored most of the time under the tubers sometimes they are of course stored in the Uh, leaf itself fruit nuts everywhere the the food will be stored so it is uh, occurring in a downward and upward lateral in all directions the food has to move now <coughs> this it takes place from the leaves downwards to the stem root and storage organs upward direct uh, translocation in some stages of a plant life such as a seed germination emergence of a new shoots from the underground storage organs and the development of buds flowers and fruits 
the food materials are translocated upward this is upward translocation okay so under what circumstances you get the upward translocation emerge seed germination a point emergence of new shoots from the underground storage organs then development of buds plus fruits these are all the three situations in which the food has to be translocated from bottom to the top <coughs> then lateral translocation where it is uh, taking place in certain parts of the stem root food is a uh, translocated in lateral directions through the medullary ray that's very important so lateral translocation is uh, taking place uh, through the medullary cells or medullary rays said beautiful diagram beautiful slide to show <coughs> the translocation of water see in a beaker we have taken the water and then we have put a live plant there and this experiment is what is called as a ringing experiment what's a ringing experiment you know we are wearing the rings in your finger that's called the ring finger so it is called as a ring finger okay so just like we are wearing the ring in your finger you remove the tissues in the form of your ring that's why it's called a ringing experiment <clears throat> so in a ringing experiment we uh, remove or oh, we ring the epidermis cortex and then the phloem what we have done now we have removed the epidermis we have removed the cortex and then we have removed the phloem then after removing them then what will be there in the plant only xylem will be there so what you are seeing here this portion is only xylem so xylem we have not removed but all the other things our uh, outer to the xylem you will be having the phloem outer to the phloem you will be having the cortex outer to the cortex you will be having the epidermis so leaving alone the xylem we have removed all the things so we are left with only the xylem now you see if after, even after doing this the water will be moving into the leaves the leaves become turgid how the leaf will become turgid the leaf will become turgid when it is getting only the water so they have not get wilted still the plant is able to live for many days even when you have ringed the plant when you have ringed the plant means what we have removed the phloem cortex and epidermis when you have removed all these things still the plant is able to live because the water is moving through the xylem so this experiment this ringing experiment is to prove that the water is flowing through the uh, xylem and the phloem <clears throat> there may be a question to you by which one of the following experiment the um, the flow of the water from the ground to the aerial organ is approved ringing experiment girdling experiment ganong supportometer experiment like that they have given different answers so the flow of water from the ground to the top is proved only with the help of the ringing experiment so ringing experiment is only proving that it is a proving the flow of the water through the xylem okay is it very clear to you now fine see this is another experiment called girdling experiment girdling experiment now what is a girdling experiment we remove the bark of the plant leaving the wood secondary wood after the plant is uh, becoming a uh, secondary thickening just leaving the wood alone we remove the bark see this portion this portion is removed okay this portion is removed and then once it is removed <coughs> what happens since the food is flowing in all directions which i was telling to you particularly in the downward direction to store the food material at the bottom see they are moving through the phloem cells which are present in the bark now since you have removed the bark what happens 
this portion gets uh, bulged. See? This area, this portion, in this, you please uh, compare with this. This and this. Here, the food is not getting accumulated. But since the food is getting accumulated in this region, this portion becomes swollen. Okay? This is accumulated material. Since it is getting accumulated here, this portion becomes more bulgier in size. Why it is becoming bulged? It is due to the accumulation of the food. Why the food is getting accumulated there? Because it is not able to pass through the girdled portion. You have removed the bark. So the food is not able to pass through this. So it is getting accumulated there. Now you are able to understand, it's a beautiful experiment, a beautiful experiment to prove that the food is uh, translocated from the top of the plant to the uh, regions of requirement through the phloem region and it is uh, mainly through the downward portion. It is an experiment to prove that uh, point in the plant, that, plant, that point in the translocation. Okay. So the food is uh, moving in all directions, it is uh, moving through the phloem. All these points are proved with the help of the hurdling experiment. Perhaps the last slide in this, uh, one more slide is there I think, the 29th slide. Here, it is uh, taking place uh, with the, uh, when the food is, uh, move, when the, when the food is uh, moving from one region to another region, how this uh, movement is uh, taking place, uh, people were thinking for a quite long time, how this uh, movement could take place and they have advanced so many theories uh, to prove this but one very common acceptable explainable theory is uh, what is uh, called as a munch mass flow hypothesis it was uh, proved by a great scientist called munch in, in his name the experiment goes munch now there is a mass flow of the food material that's why it is called as a munch mass flow hypothesis. What is a munch mass flow hypothesis? Now, it's very simple, very easy to understand. <coughs> now, as the different materials are flowing in our blood system, different hormones are being secreted and they are transported. We are taking food material, it is getting digested. And then this uh, food material has to be transported to the different parts of the body. So how these uh, transport is uh, taking place within, within our body? It is uh, taking place in a mass. It is uh, taking place in a mass through the blood. Okay, something like that. So in the transport of the prepared food material is also taking place in N mass within the plant and it is able to move from one area to another area beautifully. This is why it is called the Munch mass flow hypothesis. Here he has uh, taken two osmometers. One is an osmometer containing a concentrated sugar solution. In this osmometer he has uh, taken a dilute sugar solution. Concentrated sugar solution, dilute sugar solution. Now these uh, two osmometers are connected by a tube T. Now the whole setup is put in a pure water. I am explaining the experiment. So this is a membrane X, this is a membrane Y and this is a dilute sugar solution, concentrated to solution. Two osmometers are there connected by a common T tube, the whole setup in the water. Okay. Now we will see what happens. This forms the basis of the principle of a phloem loading and uploading. Phloem loading is caused by the movement of a photosynthesis from the mesophyll to the phloem. Uploading of phloem is caused by the movement of a photosynthesis from the phloem to the other parts where required. This is the source of a sink relationship. Now you see, the, in the plant where the food is prepared, it is called as a source. It is called as a source. <coughs> And the place where the food is required to be stored, it is called as a sink. So, two regions are there. One is a source, another one is a sink. So, the food is flowing from the source to the sink in a 
n mos way so it is able to flow very easily as the different food materials are transported through our blood system also so no energy is in uh, spending of energy no active transport nothing is there just like you are pouring your water from a higher level it automatically reaches a lower level see you have got a glass tumbler here and you have got a very big trough here so when you are just pouring the water it reaches the trough very easily and most it is simply flowing so he is able to explain that the flow of the food material in a plant is also it's a mass flow me mechanism of course there are certain objections for the mass flow mechanism theory is there but the problem here is all the other theories ex i mean put forward to explain this mass flow this is this seems to be more reasonable and quite explainable that is why we say that a munch mass flow hypothesis is even though it has got many objections so we accept this because of all the different theories this is a most acceptable theory with less objection that's why we accept the munch mass flow hypothesis so to sum up what i have done what i have we have Uh, i have explained it to you today two aspects i have trans, uh, told you one is um, translocation another one is a uh, transportation so how the materials are moving within the plant from the xylem to uh, to the upper part of the region and from the region of photosynthesis to the different uh, regions of the storage how the uh, I mean materials are moving i have explained it to you very clearly and the different uh, physical principles involved in this also i have explained it to you very clearly and the, uh, if i got any doubt as usual you can post me any number of questions i will be very very happy to explain to you bye